you want to build a community, um, you have to support it. You have to be involved. And you have to be involved for something other than yourself. You have to be involved for others. So it's, you know, maybe you call it quid pro quo, maybe you just call it, you know, helping somebody out or, or, or whatever, but, you know, small membership fees to things like New Leaf Digital, small um, subscriptions to uh, podcasts or things like that, or supporting those things. You have a podcast, right? <clears throat> so support those kinds of things with your time. Support them if you can financially. But you'll get out of these things what you put into them. I can tell you firsthand. So that's my little spiel on that. So today I want to talk about validating your idea specifically without going broke in the process. Now, I'm not going to say you're not going to go broke six months from now. Okay? But I don't want you to go broke before you even have an idea of whether this thing is going to work. So very quickly, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So I have about 20 years. Everybody see that? You okay? Okay. 20 years of uh, sales and operations experience. I have founded three startups. Um, I grew a service business from $65 million to $100 million in 24 months, and I did that with technicians in the field in rural Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. I have some more stories. Um, and then I managed, when I was actually only 28, I was managing a $900 million sales, tour, uh, sales territory for Dish Network. Totally irresponsible on their part. But uh, learned a whole lot, and then went on to get some uh, professional certifications from places hopefully you've heard of. Um, so about us and Red Hawk in general, we call ourselves an entrepreneur development company. A, because I don't like the term consultant, and B, because it's not all that we do, okay? So we're, we were founded in 2015, I came out of the private equity and venture capital space, um, and I did that with the specific goal of working with entrepreneurs, right? I don't really work with big companies, right? It's not my niche, it's not what I'm best at. We offer training, coaching, and consulting, and it's all specifically designed for entrepreneurs, okay? So consulting as an example, I, we don't do retainers, okay? Very rare, right? And what I mean by that is you come to us, you say we want to fill a gap in expertise or in resource, and we want to only fill it for a period of time that's short, right? So we're gonna go in and we say, here's the project, here's the deliverables, here's the timeline, here's the cost, and then we're gonna get off your p &L. Right? Why? Because you can't afford me on retainer, right? And you shouldn't try to get me on retainer, nor anybody else, right? He's not doing like fractional CFO stuff, which, by the way, huge benefit. Look at that, I'm serious. Um, and then to give you an idea, we had you know, one anchor client, just like anybody else who starts a small professional services firm, and then now we've worked with 35 different clients. And they're from pre-formation all the way through. We've got an industrial client that's been around for 80 years. It's actually owned by an asbestos trust. Again, I've got war stories. Okay. So anybody here watch Last Chance You on Netflix? Okay, anybody know who Brittany Wagner is? Show of hands. Wow, none of you Netflix benders. Okay. She's, she was the academic uh, advisor, counselor for East Mississippi Community College. It's called Last Chance You. It's because it's where all the athletes go before they basically get bounced out of football forever. So they could have a you know an arrest. They could have academic issues, they could have other issues. She has gained some popularity in that. The only reason I say that is we helped her start her new company, 10,000 Miles right? And we took her from nothing to two $200,000 contracts in six weeks. Now, I'd like to take credit for all of it, but she is kind of famous, which helps, right? <laughs> but in the, in the neat thing about this, and this is what I talk about this community, I talk about this cooperation, the first $100,000 contract she got was an ambassadorship contract, which is a fancy way of saying licensing, right? And it was her new client that I paired up with an existing client, National Scouting Report, which is an ambassador, if you're familiar with that, okay? That's what I'm talking about. That's how that stuff happens, right? I was just lucky enough to be in the middle of that. So, anyway, that's a little bit about us. I wanna to talk to you guys, why start a fan? Oh, first of all, how many in, you, in here right now consider yourself pre-formation? Okay, how many of you would consider yourselves pre-revenue? Okay, how many of you would consider yourselves pre-scale? Meaning I have revenue, but I'm not, okay? Good, good, good mix. All right, fantastic. So some of you already know why your startup is failing. No, I'm kidding. Um, but why, <laughs> you're living through it. Why do startups fail? What do you think? Come on. This is the part where you guys talk. Um, cash flow. Not cash flow money. meaning what? Undercapitalized. Okay, or you're saying very fancy ways of saying? More going out than coming in. I don't have any money. Running out of money, right? Yes. What else? Um, the 
team. Your team. Good. What else? Like mentorship. Huh? I will say mentorship. Okay, good. Yeah, good to have mentors. What else? What about, about customers? Not, what about them? Not having enough. Not having enough, sure. Not what knowing else? your customer. Not knowing your customer. Bad customer profile. Sure. What else? Work ethic. Really? <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll buy that. Do you have something? Anybody else? What else? Bad monetization idea. Uh, you're getting close to the number one reason. No market need. Nobody wants your stuff. <laughs> nobody wants your stuff. I'm not convinced that nobody wants your stuff. You and I can have a conversation. Uh, I'd love to. After, after this, we'll So ran out of cash is number two. But look at this. 42% of the time, nobody wants your stuff. They're not picking up what you're laying down. Okay? And that's the key. So today, what we're going to talk about is I want to try to solve for these two things, or at least help you think through how do you solve for these two things. Now, you guys really had a bunch of things in there that I thought were good. Like if your team sucks, your team sucks. It's not going to go anywhere. Okay? You're going to fight it. You're going to spend all your time arguing about dumb stuff. If you've got a team member who doesn't want to work, oh my God, it's like an anchor around your neck. Okay? Those are all valid things, but I want you to focus in on those, those top two things. So, this, these things that I'm going to talk about today, just to be clear, no matter what stage you're in, these are applicable for a new business launch, for a new product launch, or for a pivot. Anybody in here done a pivot before? Yeah, it's a euphemism for what? Change of strategy. I, I'm going down the tubes and I got to change, right? Most time when you face a pivot, you're in an inflection point where it's I do this or I don't do, period, right? So this will be, I'll think of one of those things. Applying a rigorous review and critique is important for all of these activities. You can talk yourself into anything, right? Anybody in here ever done that? Talk yourself, oh, that's a fantastic idea. I can't believe nobody else has done it. There may be a reason nobody else has done it, right? And any other requirements, conditions, need to accomplish any of these are the same, right? You're gonna go through the same process regardless of what your situation is. So we're going to go over these validation tools, benchmarking, a business canvas, financial projections, and market validation. It's not nearly as boring as it looks on the screen, I promise. So benchmarking your idea. How big is the potential market? Anybody have a fancy name for that? They teach it in business school. It's called TAM, Total Addressable Market. Okay. Who's already out there doing it? For you guys in the ride share business, there are people doing it. They're kind of big. Right? Are you a substitute for an existing solution? Okay, who was talking about you were in the corner? Okay. <laughs> so your business model is, and, and you're feeling so far right now is there isn't a market here. I am potentially serving an unmet need, unserved need that may be nascent. They don't know it yet. I'm trying to fit in the middle. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. But the point is, who's trying to be, who believes that they're trying to be a substitute for an incumbent? Raise your hand and raise your hand. <laughs> right? Okay. And why is that important? Why is that important? Because in order to succeed, you have to have like a personal niche or something that separates. Well, why is it important making that differentiation between I'm a substitute or I'm, I'm addressing an unmet need? It, 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 it changes how you address the market. How? You mean like you might, you're more aggressive versus if you're the first one in the market. Because now you know you have a competitor and you know that you're going against someone else. Versus but what are you freaking out about trying to create the market that may not exist? Nobody, if, if nobody wants it. No, nobody wants it. Yeah. How expensive is it for me to market a product and get people excited about a market that doesn't exist? Right. Meanwhile, you've got to fight against a 5,000 employee global juggernaut called Uber. <laughs> Right? So your, so your substitution versus your unmet need is a totally different approach. Equally difficult, right? Anybody, anybody ever been to a Cirque du Soleil? Yeah, right? You, what, what made Cirque du Soleil so uh, successful? Does anybody know anybody ever read a case study on it? pretty fast. What? They stopped focusing on kids. They, that's correct. They, they went for adults that can do what? Mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially. What else? After they buy their mushroom, what can they do? They can spend more money, right? You can have a hundred dollars to let the Soleil ticket. You can't take four kids to Cirque du Soleil at a hundred dollars a piece, right? What else do they do? What's not in a Cirque du Soleil show? No animals. No animals. You know what the most expensive thing is for a traveling circus? Animals. Thank you very much. Okay. 
And then they created this market out of nowhere. This was this is the case study for the blue ocean strategy. Is everybody familiar with that? Anybody familiar with that? The idea is there's red ocean, which is the sharks are all in there and they're eating everything up and it turns the ocean red. Or it's blue ocean, there's no sharks, you're the only shark. You get to run it. But you have to create the market, which means you have to create the demand, and you have to create the sense of demand. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, how much are the incumbents charging? What do you think the number one strategy for somebody who's coming in as a substitution usually uh, incorporates in their strategic plan? Under price. Huh? Under price. How? Under price. Is it easier for you to, to discount something as a startup than it is for an incumbent? No. And then what happens when they match you? Uh, yeah, it's business. gone. Well, you do what? You change your crop. <laughs> so you Maybe. Or cut your price again. Cut your price again. Then it becomes a race to the bottom. Okay? And they can afford to put you out of business because they have cash, you don't. Okay? So you need to be thinking about that. What are they charging? Okay, and we're gonna get back to how, how that can or cannot or, or may not matter to you. Okay? And then how would you compete with incumbents? I'm going to tell you right now, if, you're, if your entire business model is discount, right, and it's not a substantial discount, there's a difference, right? If you're going to say $1,000 versus $45,000, that's credible. But if you're going to say, I'm not going to charge, I'm going to charge five cents less per mile than Uber does, that's not a strategy, right? You get that? Okay. <laughs> so that's the first part. So the second part is, anybody ever done a business canvas? Lean business canvas, lean startup, anything like that. What did you think of the experience? Well, it raised a lot of questions. Okay. And it kind of got me going in a direction I really hadn't explored yet. Okay. Like, like for example, what kind of accounting system are you going to have? Yep. You're going to use cost. That's why I asked you to talk to me. You're going to use cost. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? <laughs> I would say it was a good way to kind of get a roadmap on clear yep. on what each component was. Yep. yep. For those of you who don't know what a business canvas is, there's about I don't know, a hundred different versions of it, right? But, there, but it was started with this lean startup model and this lean startup canvas. And the idea here is that what you're trying to do is put everything about your business kind of in a framework and create a rough draft, okay? And so those main concepts, approaches, your assumptions, they're all captured in one place. And the reason that's important is because you're gonna start seeing that change over time and that, that could pretty dramatically change. And I'm not just talking about naming changes or you know, email, website, domain changes. I'm talking about whole approaches to market may shift once you see everything all in one place. So, and, and that's going to help you start kind of that review and iteration process. And again, remember, we're trying to do this without going broke because you can do this just with your own time, right? You're not paying anybody to do this. Now, um, that, is that an app or some type of a download you can get? I mean, well, since you're here. You give me your email address or you email me at the end, I will send you one. Okay. And I'm going to send you a couple other ones too. Mm -hmm. The Canvas Whack is an outline for your eventual business plan. And I want, to, I want to put that in. People go from nothing to business plan. And I'm telling you that's bad. A, it's really hard. B, it's not going to be complete. Okay. And C, it's probably not going to make all the assumptions you need to make and test all of the interconnected pieces to it. Okay. So this is before that. You're going to benchmark, see who else is out there, and go, that's pretty red ocean, right? Or, hey, that's a big blue ocean, but it's a it's slightly bigger ocean than I'm ready to jump into. Or, hey, I think we have a place here, right? Total addressable market seems decent. <coughs> Competitors are right about here. Our product differentiation, which we're going to talk about in a second, is significant, right? Then you're going to get to this canvas, okay? We're going to walk through very high level um, the pieces of this. But I want to talk, tell you, this canvas should take you about a week to do. If you do this in an hour, you haven't tried hard enough. And if you're not revising this at least three times, you're not thinking hard enough. Or you're not doing your research. Okay? So in this, you're going to start seeing in, in, in traditional models, you'll see it. And it's lined out on a big piece of paper and it's got all these little sections and stuff like that. And you're more than willing to do that if you're a visual person. To me, as long as I list them and they're all there, that works just as well, right? But you're going to talk about key partners. Who are the people that you're going to have to partner with? Is it other organizations, right? Is it individuals? Is it some technology, right? What do those partners look like? Is it distribution? But if you're going to have an Amazon store, that's a partner. Amazon becomes a partner.
partner. And to be a partner charges you a whole lot too, by the way. Okay? But they're a partner. Key activities, what are we doing? Are we, are we doing software development? Are we manufacturing? Are we doing a lot of design work? Right? For you, it's gonna be a ton of editing, right? It's gonna be a ton of, of the, the technology setup. What do I have to have? How do I integrate all that technology based on the platform, based on the media, right? The key resources are gonna be things that I need to get there. And key resources can include things like, oh, for example, I need money and lots of it from a lot of different people, right, potentially. What do those resources look like? Mentors fall really well in key resources. If you don't have a mentor for your business right now, get one, preferably three, <laughs> okay? And that's again, I'm gonna keep harping on this, that's where that community part comes in. Right? When somebody really is invested in you and you're investing in them in a mentorship, mentee, mentee type deal, you're going to get a lot out of that. So that's a resource. We're going to get back to value proposition in a second because we're going to spend a little bit of time on that. Customer relationships. What, how are you maintaining, building, creating those relationships? Are they transactional? Are they <coughs> over a long period of time? Is this a recurring transaction or is it a, just a single transaction? And then what are the resources you have to have for that? If you're billing them monthly, you're gonna to need to have something like customer service. They're gonna need a number to call. And despite what you think, it can't all be done via chat box, okay? Uh, channels, so uh, where am I going to move this product? Where does it have to go through? Is it wholesale, is it direct, is it indirect? Is it a mixture of both, some sort of hybrid? What do those channels look like? What are the requirements for those channels? <laughs> Call structures, this is a great one, right? This is when somebody tells me, oh, it's okay, because I'm not taking any money for the first year. And then I immediately go, fix it, okay? I don't care if you can. Your business model is flawed if you cannot at least pay yourself. Everybody get that? Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and then revenue streams, and this is where a lot of people, and Dick will back me up on this because I know he's seen this a bunch. So in revenue streams, the, the business model is founded on the idea of a single revenue stream. And you don't consider that there might be multiple revenue streams. I'm going to use myself as an example. When I started Red Hawk, I was going to be a consulting firm for entrepreneurs. You know what I found out? Entrepreneurs are broke. <laughs> okay? A lot of times, and I'm not working for free, right? So what I had to do, I had to start thinking about, well, how do I deliver services in a way that they can pay for it and is still worthwhile? And we'll talk about how I've done that kind of at the end. But now there's multiple revenue streams for that off that I only considered one in the beginning. So I am living testimony to why that's a flaw, right? So I know you guys already think about myself data, right? Ah, yeah, the data play, right? You know how long it's gonna take you before you get your data play? How many years? Five. Uh, probably, probably, right? And that's with a decent use of it, right? But it's good, I'm glad you're thinking about that. Think about where it's coming from, but also think about when that's going to happen, okay? Uh, all right, so we're gonna move, oh, so back to value proposition. Everybody know what a value proposition is? What are you delivering to a customer that they're going to pay you for versus paying somebody else or using that money somewhere else? This is it, guys. This is the one part of the canvas that has to be absolutely 100% bulletproof, defendable. Meaning that somebody can't just come in and go, oh, so all of the ride sharing uh, uh, stuff that you do is yellow. Uh, easy enough, now all my stuff's yellow. <coughs> Oops, not very defendable. Right? So this is where you have to spend time. Anybody in here feel like they have a good value proposition for their business? Okay, let's hear it. Oh no, we can do both. Okay. We got time. Okay, so Coverage USA is set up based on a short backstory. So for my no, life, no backstory, I just want your value proposition. So value proposition simply is you can't buy toner from retail for less than we can sell it to you here. You can't buy it cheaper on Amazon than we can sell it to you. Same toner in the box, not refurbished. It's the same stuff. Okay. Good. Here. So my value proposition is that we we partner with university and university to cut from it. So it's not only that like we have other countries or have better that transportation, not only increasing their enrollment, but also they're getting paid as well. Because okay. if they're using competitors, that's just straight consumer. Right, right. So so in in simplest terms, if you partner with us, you're also getting paid. Yeah. 
Pretty good. Yeah. Local TV commercials suck. <laughs> Mine are way better. Mine are way better. I'll work on the language on that, yeah. but not a bad start. Seriously. Yeah. Right? And that's the thing. Like, So anybody ever been involved in crafting a mission statement or, or value statement or something like that for a company or a corporation? Anybody ever done that? Did you, did you enjoy it? Did you think it was a colossal waste of time? Yeah. Right? You don't know why? You know how that's transitioned now? So Walmart's used to be, I, I once had the word count, so I apologize, I don't have any more. But, but five years ago, Walmart's mission <coughs> statement, value statement, was 53 words long. That's not a statement, that's paragraphs, right? It's now uh, 12 words long. So to your point, brevity has its value, okay? Get this right before you do anything else. If when you say that to people, and I'm not kidding you, if you could walk up to a stranger on, on the street and go, this is what our ride sharing does, right? You partner with us, you're gonna get paid too. Uber's not gonna take all your money, we're gonna share it with you. And if they don't go, ooh, go back and rework it. It has to make sense. Now I'm not asking you to go and do it outside of your market or people who wouldn't care about video production, right? Or wouldn't care about the apps that you're making, they're just not your target market. But you should literally get a response from somebody that tells you, hey, we're onto something here. Because you don't get to tell a backstory. Right? You get 15 words. Okay? Any questions on that before I move on? And yes, you, I have a template that I'm gonna give you guys, and you can work through every single one of this and explains in detail for each one of these what goes in that category. And can we get a copy of the presentation too? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to love this part. I'm gonna have, I should just have you come up and teach this part. One of the things, and, and again, I'm, I'm, Dick's looked at a lot of deals, Dick's looked at a lot of businesses, as has Tony. And so one of the things, agree or disagree, that's usually missing, incorrect, or poorly drafted 90% of the time. Or, or unrealistic. <laughs> at least unrealistic, for sure. Okay? This is something that freaks most non-financial people out. Okay? I'm gonna tell you, A, I'm gonna take some, everybody's going, I can see everybody's shoulders like raising up a little bit, like intense, okay? I'm gonna give you another template for this, okay? So everybody just relax, and a deep breath, namaste, right? Everybody, yeah. Namaste, okay. <laughs> but basically this space, this comes into three pieces. Now, you can make it more complex than this, but I'm not advocating that. You're looking at three things, revenue, expenses, and cash flow, okay? Why revenue? I know, we're just gonna say it all out together. Why revenue? Huh? You gotta have fuel, right? You gotta put fuel in the right? It's the fuel of the business. Why, why, why expenses? You got stuff to pay for and? And? Pay yourself. Well, maybe, yeah. But why is it also important when you're talking about revenue and you're talking about expenses? Make sure your expenses are lower than your revenue. Well, they may not be. But you gotta see what your cash flow and your cash reserves look like. When you are starting a business or when you're just getting started, you may have some seed capital that you raised from friends, you may just have a 401k that you've cashed in, bad idea, but you may have done it, right? <laughs> okay? You may have done that and it's created what we call a runway. Are people familiar with that? You know what a runway is? Just like a plane, right? The longer, the more money you have, the longer your run runway. The more you spend it, the shorter your runway gets. And what happens if you're not up to speed and flying by the time you hit the end of the runway? It's not good. Okay? So cash is king. Cash is king. Your cash flow position matters. Your cash flow and your cash position matters. Okay? And if you are if you are successfully combining your financial realities with specific time frames, this is where my CFO and accounting buddies will, will go. Yeah. Right? Because it's not enough for me to say, well, I'm gonna make hundred thousand dollars next year. And I'm gonna spend eighty thousand dollars next year. Okay. In which months? In which time periods? Because that's your cash flow. If you're gonna if you're gonna go eleven months spending eighty thousand dollars to make a hundred thousand dollars in month twelve, you need to project for that. The time frames matter, and that's where a lot of people screw up because they're only thinking about end result twelve months from now or end result eighteen months from now. The other thing I suggest you do is do it for two years. Okay, do it for two years. Here's the other thing I'm gonna tell you. Just to discount everything I just said, it's a complete work of fiction. Okay? But it's better than nothing. Okay? You can iterate on a financial projection the same way you do on a business canvas 
or a strategic statement or anything else. But you have to have one. Why? If I just told you it's fiction, why do it? Because you gotta set realistic goals. Well, because you have to have what? You game plan. You have to have a game plan, but why else? Guidance, you have to be able to know what you're looking at ahead of time. Right? You decide, hey, this great strategic partnership came along. And this person wants to give me $20,000 for 15% of my company. I better be able to look at my projections, A, and present it to them because they're going to want to see that. And B, is that $15,000, $20,000 worth the percentage you're going to give up? Well, if you don't have that, you have no way of knowing. Make sense? That's why it's important. Sure. I'm oh, sorry, do we have more questions? We will at the end, for sure, but, I can, but I'll take one right now. Oh, yeah, no, just in reference to this, um, I've noticed a lot of times when you're like presenting this type of information to investors and you're like either, you know, in the, that beta phase or, you know, uh, I, I forget the terminology you use, but you're not even close to the point where you're making revenue, right? So like you said, work of fiction are most of the time I'm thinking, I can talk well, but is the person I'm talking to think this is complete crap? Like the whole so, time, I'm, you know what I'm saying, giving them projections on things that haven't been moved forward yet. So Dick, share on the on the investor side, what's the perspective on that? Well, first of all, I want to know what's, what are you going to do when your revenues are only half of what you projected? Mm -hmm. Or more, which is more. What's your plan for adversity? Yeah. You know, I'll understand your plan for accomplishing what you're proposing, but what's going to happen if things change? Yeah. yeah. A lot of times in my experience, investors are not necessarily looking to assess the even how ridiculous or not ridiculous or how reasonable it is. They're trying to assess for when it doesn't go this way, do I have people in front of me that can deal with it? Mm -hmm. Right? And it's best to do it dynamically. I mean, you have a best worst. Yeah, absolutely. You know, low, high, yeah. mid. Yep. You don't just do one, right? I mean, What I usually do is I say, do a likely one and then do 20% overperform and 30% underperform. And now what you have total is you have a 50% delta. And if you've got a plan for a 50% delta, you become much more defendable. You become much more solid than you did without one. Because now you're gonna go, okay, well, that program I just hired is not with us anymore. And that 30% down, right? And that 20% up too, investors wanna see that, right? Especially if you go to raise money again, that 20% up is huge. You got a plan for that as well, right? It's not just, it's not just a doomsday scenario. So, I put this up there because you have to, okay? So, it's basically the various revenue streams and the presumed month in which they are. You guys are gonna be operating on what's called a cash basis for your accounting, okay? If you're working on accrual, you're operating on another level, okay? And you probably have some investment capital, okay? But most startups are working in a cash model, which means that you're basically recognizing expenses and cash as they're paid or received. <clears throat> in that exact time frame, okay? Even I'm on cash basis, I've been in business for three years. There's just no reason for me to be a girl, right? But that means that I have to be really specific about that time frame, okay? And this is really the key to it. We, we've alluded to this, but try to avoid too much optimism or pessimism. Look at providing yourself a dynamic range. 20% up, 30% down, if you wanna be 25% up, 40%, I really don't care, but give yourself a decent spread, okay? Matt, one of the things that, let me just throw this out. One time I heard some guy said, I'll pay anything for anything if I, if I dictate the terms. And I thought about that. I said, yeah, if I, I'll pay a million so. bucks for a pencil <laughs> if I don't have to pay it uh, until 2000, you know, 2100 or something. And that, that's really where it, it becomes clear. Yeah. Terms are everything. And you'll run into private investors who will invest with exactly that, that investment thesis. Right? And you end up with something and you go, I can't that. I mean, you might as well just got a payday loan. I mean, it's that bad, right? I no longer own my car, right? Mm -hmm. Now that happened. <laughs> Again, very simply, list the expenses in the month are going to be incurred. If you have salaries or things like that that you can amortize, do that. Don't just front load them, right? And, and I'm going to say this because I saw somebody do it. A client of mine decided that they were bringing somebody on for about $50,000 a year and decided that they were going to pay them twenty five. dollars but you're still going broke, right? This is where you have to challenge yourself to go, I can't get stuck 
in my altruistic, in my own ego, in my own, well, I'll just work harder, right? I hear that all the time. Well, I'll just work harder. You can work as hard as you want, right? But if you're selling a refrigerated uh, trucking or refrigerated uh, yeah. container, right, north of the Arctic Circle, <laughs> you're going out of business. Right? We're going out of business in South Georgia. You're going out of business in South Georgia, so what does it matter? Right? Okay, fair enough. Um, and, and the way to get around this is pre sell <laughs> And this is where everybody comes and says, eh, everybody starts tensing up again, right? It's the most effective and efficient way of you validating a market. So what do I mean by pre sell Anybody ever done it? Part of I've done it, we've done it. Grant Cardone is a pretty good example of pre sell he sold out in uh, 2,000 tickets before he knew the video was going to leave. Yeah, yeah. We think. We think. He could have just bought it himself. Yeah, not a great card. Who should? Yeah. And lots of We took the rest. Oh, yeah. yeah. What else? We built a, for the software that we're doing right now, we built a prototype and we put it in front of 30 people and said, hey, how do you like the design? And also, what do you just think about the general idea? Yeah, but did you ask them to buy it? I'm not going to ask them to buy the actual product, but yes, I did. If I deliver this and it does the things you want, will you buy it? Did yeah, that was the last question. And what they said? Uh, it was seventy-eight percent yes. Congratulations, that's pre sell yeah. You don't. You don't. Get, you, you, well, now that's crazy. Um, <laughs> don't necessarily agree with that, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, it doesn't have to be. Nobody's handing you cash. Nobody's signing a contract. You are pre-selling the concept, and you are getting them to say yes. If you really want to nail them down, say great, I'm gonna have it in three months. Oh, contract your hands, sound good? Okay. Right? So with pre-selling, <clears throat> so back to the local media sucks. Sure. Alright. So if I go to TV station ad, so right now TV stations they they sell they sell ads, right? You buy enough ads, they shoot the commercial for free. Sure. They just show up with a guy with a camera and they say, what do you want to do? And the business owner is yeah. asked to create his own commercial. Yeah. So if I go and somehow convince, say, the ad guy to, the ad salesman to say, okay, offer a premium package. So <coughs> we'll create this thing where we bring in real, real camera crew, hair, makeup, lighting, all that. They'll create the content, you know, bring it in, it's gonna cost you more per spot, but you have this premium package. Is that, would you consider that as pre-selling? Well, did you ask them for the sale? I didn't hear that part. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, would, I, would, I mean, I mean, I haven't, I, I'm No, no, I'm, I'm saying if you're in that conversation, say if I can deliver yeah. this in 30 days, you like, on board. So yeah, I mean, I'm it's saying, it's I'm it's saying, it's I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna produce this for 2,500 bucks. Yep. You know, yeah. yeah. That's, but you gotta hold their feet to the fire, because remember, this is philosophical. Right. Right. They're not actually giving you cash. And trust me, the difference between a customer saying, sure, I'll buy it, and actually giving you cash are two totally different things. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Right. So can you get an agreement in principle? Right? Can you write something up and say, this is not a contract, however, we plan to deliver X, Y, and Z to X on price, and you plan to buy it? Then you'll get your real answer. Yeah. Right? You want to be able to get, you don't have to take cash, but you need something that looks like a real commitment, that you can go back and go, well, gee, I'm confused. You said you're going to buy this, now you're saying you're not. And I have this piece of paper that says you're going to buy it. But instead of selling to the, going out and finding a business owner, <coughs> you need to make a commercial going to the TV station. Yeah, and then the TV station. And then, yeah, well, maybe, and, right. right and yeah. Making him an ally and saying, hey. But potentially they've got a full time employee, they've right. got camera equipment, they've got other expenses just sitting there waiting for somebody to spend enough money. To, to produce their own commercial, right. and it may be a crappy commercial, which means they won't do it in the future. Exactly. You're all setting all of that stuff for them. I, I'm Could be actually wrong. increasing their their potential to, you know, I mean, if, if they have a better commercial, they're going to continue running spots. Yeah. On them. So for uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. For sure. Thanks. You had you had your hand up. You answered it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if if the product can't be sold or pre-sold, you have to ask yourself why. Okay, and there's usually two answers. One is you're not there yet with your model. Your assumptions are off. The product, the the the, the unique product or unique value proposition or the value proposition is not there yet. It's not strong enough. You're not talking to the right customer base. Go back to your business canvas and go where where am I missing here? Because it's all building blocks, and you gotta have all of that, right? 
What is it that I don't have? Am I not offering the right technologies? Everybody gone to like, you know, selfie sticks and Facebook Live? They haven't, but, right? Look at those things. The other thing is, is I don't want to pre-sell it. I don't care what that guy who, who was in the front of this room said. I don't want to do it because I don't like doing that. Then you've got kind of an existential question. Are you ready to do this? Right? Because you're ready to put your personal finances on the line. You're ready to put your career on the line. Your family, friends, whoever, you know, rely on you. If you can't do that, you got to seriously sit down and, and, and be kind of honest with yourself. Are you ready to do this? The other answer is if you go, I, I can't do it, I, I just can't do it, then you need to have a co-founder that can and will, right? Does that make sense? Real quick, and I'll answer that question. Does that make sense? I want that to sink in for everybody. Yeah? I think the, <clears throat> I think the number one problem for people who don't feel like confident in doing it is that they don't necessarily feel as confident in their product or what they're putting out as they think they are. And the reason I brought that up was because when you mentioned Grant Cardone, remind me I sold Chevy for a year, and that was like that was the word is bond, like that was all the, the Bible to them. Pre-selling, like getting the customer to put down on a piece of paper, like if I can do this for you, will you go ahead and yeah. sign this? Yeah. Just a tip for y'all. If y'all looking at cars, know they're gonna do that to you. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, it's like <clears throat> people. If you're not like you know confident in your product and you won't be able to say if I can come through on this can I trust you to sure and there's no reason why if you don't believe in your product that you can't demand your customer that your customer come through on their end you know what I'm saying or for sure. at least suggest it for sure yeah yeah there was a business owner here in Huntsville I, I talked talked to a few nights ago and uh, three of us were, were baby boomers and we talked about how we reached the baby boomers and that just doesn't work with a group of people like 35 years old and younger. What do you mean? <clears throat> well, she, she's using meetup.com. Uh, if anyone here is, is a meetup organizer, everyone knows about meetup.com. Yeah, she has 900 people uh, in the meetup. The, at least a lot of them are ghost members, but 900 on, on paper. And um, at about age 40 and above, these people will come to the meetup. Uh, She'll discuss some ideas, have an interesting subject, and then that turns into hopefully a client. And so she does hypnotherapy. And I know a guy with anxiety, people that smoke tobacco, whatever. They've done hypnotherapy, and for some people, maybe 30% is great. But um, my, I guess my question is what about this generational difference? In, in what regard? I'm having a marketing plan for millennials. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, and Tony is a great person to talk about this because that's her expertise. And she can talk about kind of customer segmentation and how do you reach those. But one of the things that's coming up, and, and, and I'll get back to this in just a second, but one of the things that's coming up right now is that within marketing and within the creative space, the, 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 the key thing there is engagement, right? Because attention is fleeting. And it used to be that marketing was getting your attention. Now it's getting your engagement. Anybody can get your attention, right? There's, there's okay. people who are literally professional YouTubers. So my point is, it's, that's a real big question that you want to get with pros like Tony to talk about. Because that is not my, I am not an expert in that stuff at all, to be honest. Yeah. Because if you're my third business coach, because the first two crash work ethic. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Yeah. You don't have, you aren't going to have that issue with Tony. Yeah. yeah. I just had a, a real quick one. Particularly here, I mean, there are a lot of products that are having intellectual property and, and maybe they're not copyrighted or protected to the point. So when you go to, I can see a lot of people saying, well, I don't want to show the customer yet because I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't want to give my secret away. So how do you get past that? I mean, you can have, you, you can go and you can meet with patent attorneys and they will sell you all sorts of you know, presumed protection. Um, but the reality is, is you have to think about not just having that protection, but are you willing to spend the money to defend it in the first place? Right? I mean, if you take technology to Raytheon and Raytheon decides that they want it, they're going to take it. You're in the I don't care. You're not, I'm showing your customer, I mean, oh, you know, no, opening I mean, the... I get it. But if your customer's Raytheon and Raytheon decides that, I'm not saying Raytheon. But I'm saying if Raytheon wants to go and do it, they can crush you with their legal team on right, retainer. Right. And you're not going to even try to defend it because you're going to go broke in the process. So my point is, is 
that sucks. It happens. It's pretty rare in my experience, um, but I think it's worth being aware. Snapchat, 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 Snapchat. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Buy sure. it. Like, All right. I'm going to get these last two things, and then I'm going to I'm going to wrap it up. So again, just to recap, we talked about benchmarking, right? Get out there and see who else is in your space. Potentially, that's a competitor. Okay. Um, do a business canvas. Do it a couple times. Spend some time on it. Get it right, especially your value proposition. Make sure you have financial projections. I know they're a work of fiction. Okay, and they're going to change a lot, but it is <laughs> guidance and it is helpful as you plan to go forward. Remember that the, your cash, your finances are the fuel of the whole thing. And without it, you're not going anywhere. So make sure you have at least a guiding idea of where you're supposed to be going. And then market validation. Go out and pre-sell it. Go out there and, and see what users are telling you about it. Right? If it's an app where maybe it's 99 cents, it's not a huge, it's not a huge lift. Right? <coughs> making it up, or 4.99 or whatever it is. But you can get a group of people together, you can show up and say, tell me what you like and what you don't like. Would you buy it? Right? Yes or no. And ask them to be honest with you. Say, don't, I, I, this is not to make me feel better. This is to help me understand if this product is worthwhile or not. Okay? So, just kind of a shameless plug here. That's some information about us. Um, my email address is right there. I'm happy to get it to anybody who wants it. Um, we do consulting, coaching, and training. And then our latest thing, this is what I'm really excited about. I'm using myself as an example of the multiple revenue streams. Um, not everybody can afford that, right? Because that's about six grand a week. Okay, you're like, yeah, no, not there, right? <laughs> but we do coaching, we do one-on-one -on -one coaching that's about six to eight hours uh, a month. It's a grand, okay? Still not cheap, okay? It's called, it's called what it is, but now we're talking, right? Now we can figure out how to, how to make that happen. Uh, and then training. Let's say, for example, you get to a point of scale and you have an entire sales force that has no idea how to train. Well, I'll come in and I'll train them for you, right? Then, on top of that, we have Hustle University. Anybody in here a comic book fan? Comic book fan? Yeah. Marvel fan? Sure. Anybody, anybody catch the reference in the name of the school? X-Men. Thank you! Come on, that's hey, a girl in the room. Come on! Oh, I'm from the science in that part. Oh, my God. Not the first part. So. Okay. So, and what we have here is we have courses that are available to people. Yeah. 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 Okay. I have a how to do your own strategic planning. It's $49. Okay. We're going to have this whole lean business canvas model up there, and it's probably going to be $49. Why would I do that? Sale. Potentially, sure. I can get to anybody, anytime, anywhere. Okay. And it's not time dependent, right? Because it's already there, which is what consulting is yeah. if you're only doing consulting. But why would I do that? Because you can. Oh, that's really sweet. <laughs> <laughs> that's real <laughs> sweet. It's an on ramp to no variable system. cost. No variable cost, correct. What else? <clears throat> it's a multiple revenue stream, guys. We just talked about it. Yeah, right? it's, it's another revenue stream for me. If I am a consultant, I am trading my time for your money. What happens when I run out of time? I can't take any more of your money. Okay? So now I've got something where I can have recurring revenue, which is the key here. That's the multiple revenue stream. But the other part is I do care. Thank you. Appreciate you looking out for me there. I do care. <laughs> um, and let's be honest, I can give you the framework for creating a strategic statement, right? And that's fine. But there's a reason why my clients pay me about three grand for that. Because it kicks ass. And they go out of there and they're ready to like run through walls. And everybody's on board and all the reasons that you do strategic planning and they've done it and we facilitate it. It's highly customized and it's badass, right? But not everybody's there yet. Doesn't mean you don't do it. Doesn't mean it's not worthwhile. So check us out on these things. You guys will get all of this presentation. Send me your email address. Tell me what you want from us, right? Tell me what you need to help. You know, if you're interested in coaching, if you're interested in, in Hustle U, if you're interested in any of it, Right? We just want to try to make some connections. Reach out. All right. Questions? Yes. Are you familiar with HubSpot? Yes. What is your view? What are your views? Are 
very expensive. <coughs> it is super expensive. Are you talking about just the C of the free CRM or are you talking about their whole suite? Oh the CRM. I'm using oh, the CRM. CRM. It's free. Okay. okay. So <laughs> what do you would you recommend? <laughs> this is like a sales one that's fifty dollars. So my question is like do you feel like it's effective? That's what we're using now for our, like our sales process and kind of going yeah, I mean, I think it depends on, the, on on your outreach, right? I mean, if you're just collecting customer information, who we've reached out to, when we've reached out, what we've done, sure. Yeah. Uh, you gotta have it somewhere, and don't have it in a spreadsheet. Yeah. On some shared Google Drive. Uh, that's a bad idea, right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So, short answer, yes. For free, it's worth it. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so I did my HubSpot in general. I was like, I don't know if you ever priced that HubSpot. Yeah, it's crushingly expensive. I but, with it. I like, wow. but in it's fairness, so you could basically start a, a digital marketing agency with one HubSpot C license. I mean, legitimately, it's that powerful. It's just super cool. Like that. Like something, something oh, it's like Harvard. The Harvard. It seemed like it's a good present, but that's always getting something. But I'm using the $50. Any of these excuses I need for Harvard. What else? What other questions can I answer? <laughs> that's right. Anything in here not make sense? Anything in here go, this guy's full of crap? So, well, you might be saying that for other reasons, but. So, how many companies that you've taken, like, for instance, an example that you gave, that you took the way it was kind of famous, what service did she buy for you to do that? Or what what she I, that, that, again, that's a great question. So, she's a little bit unique. I, I have um, a business manager relationship with her. Um, so, now I'm a business manager for celebrity, which is, I'll be honest with you. You should see the emails I have to answer. I can do some work. I'm just going to say, her <coughs> gender. We're, we're kind of gross. We're kind of creepy. I oh, emails, you mean? You see emails that female celebrities <laughs> yeah. get. But anyway, that, that was a little bit of a one-off. So basically, so I, I, take a, I take a percentage of the, the revenue that she generates through 10,000 pencils on a monthly basis. Okay, so would you do that by company or that would just hurt? I mean, theoretically. That was kind of a one-off. I don't know that I'm going to be in the celebrity business all that well, often. Well, not celebrity. I guess I'm, well, I guess if I was talking about like, that example and then another one that you said that you took from there, I, I guess I'm just trying to get, like, an um, idea on what you did and what was the effect of it. So, like, if you did coaching, you'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah. this is an example of me taking this person. Yeah, so I, I'll use Brittany as an example. So Brittany was, had nothing, knew nothing, just said, I want to start a company that does what I did at East Mississippi Community College, and I want to do it for other colleges and universities. That was all I got. And I said, okay, let's get your LLC formed, let's get your QuickBooks set up, let's do all of this stuff. I mean, it was really basic. <coughs> and then it was gonna be, we went into a business canvas and we just said, what's your customer? Who do you need? What are the resources you have? Now she's a professional services firm, so it's pretty thin, right? Not a lot of complexity there. But we had to figure out like, what was her customer base? <coughs> and then we had to adjust when we were mostly right, but somewhat wrong. Because when season two came out, the people came out of the woodwork. And we had never thought about licensing. We had never thought about that. And then I had a conversation with my client at NSR, and that became something. Where she's their official academic counselor, and she gets paid for that. Pretty nice. Wish I could be the official something of something I get paid for. That. Don't let anyone else. What other questions? What was the service business you took from 65 to 100? It was a dish network business. Um, it was a regional uh, service provider. And so they were doing about $60 million and 200 um, technicians in the field that they weren't making any money um, because they had they had no processes they had no standard operating procedures they were paying their technicians based on tenure not on performance which is a terrible idea um, so I switched that and so you got paid based on how well you performed in the job your error you know your error or defect rate your customer service rate your completion rate all of those things um, and what we were able to do was we were able to go from 200, just over 200, but 225 uh, technicians to 400 technicians. Um, that's not true, 250 to 400. We opened two new markets and we went from doing about 600 uh, to 700 work orders a day to 1,200 work orders a day. And that's how Dish put you in charge of the nine, nine dollar area? No, I don't know, that was before that. They were nuts, I hadn't learned that at all. <laughs> Dish Network is a very uh, cutthroat, uh, kind of Lord of the Flies type um, environment. And if you were ambitious and hungry um, and willing to work for far below market rates, as far as your salary goes, you got opportunities like that. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah, yeah. So that was before I went and did the, the private service business. Yep. You had a question, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was wondering when you changed the structure of the workforce, what the turnover rate was. Three percent. And everybody thought it would be like forty. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But it wasn't. Anyone know why? 
because the guys who are work, the guys who are already working hard and doing a good job saw an increase in their pay, yeah. right? Not a decrease. And the best part was, is if I had a guy that just came out of training and he hit the ground running within 90 days, he'd make as much as somebody who'd been there six years if he was putting the work in and he was doing it right. That's how it should be. That was my argument. And everybody freaked out. They're like, oh my God, there's going to be so many people who quit. And I go, I'll tell you what, if somebody quits on this because they're making less money, they're doing shitty work. And we don't want them. And that's a generational difference, too. You're talking about generational things. That's, yeah. Your generations put, put value on how it takes to do something, and millennials put value on getting stuff done. Yeah. Anybody ever get any part? You're so, so, so if did, your generation, and I was speaking completely generally here, but put value on the time it takes to do something. Yeah. Put your hard work into something and put your time into it. I know that well. The millennial generation puts value on getting things done. It doesn't matter how long it takes. They prefer as efficient as possible. Thank Plus, you. it's also opportunity based, right? So you, it's very hard to tell a millennial. Like you, I, this is one of the things that you see in Alabama a lot with the um, auto manufacturing, right? So you see it, you see it in Honda, you see it in Mercedes, you see it in Hyundai, which is one of the reasons that they've been able to, to stay out of the union business is because these workers that are coming in have zero appetite for do this job until that guy who sits up in the job that you want either dies or retires, <laughs> right? They have no appetite for that, and they know that. And because of that, they get merit-based opportunities, which is much more in line with a way a millennial thinks uh, than, than it was in the past. It's also the reason why UAW and the rest of the, the unions are struggling to get new membership and to get traction. Because somebody goes, let me see if I get this straight. I'm going to give you money every month so you can keep me out of jobs that I want. Yeah, I'll pass. I'm good, right? I'm not, I'm not that interested in it. I think the other thing with millennials, especially when I was like Grand Cardone, it was just that we have a maximum period of what we want to do when we're passionate about something. So I remember he was talking like, when you come to my job, how many years can I get there? You're going to be at your max. So if you're going to give me three years that you're going to beast it out, then I only want that three years and then you can kind of leave. Versus like older, you know, it's kind of like, okay, I'm going to do this for 40 years at a time. It kind of goes down. Yeah. You know, it's almost like an atomic half life, right? Yeah. You can only start thinking like half, that went in half. And yeah, sure. But I, I don't know if I agree with that because I feel like if if the process is working right for the the employee as well as the owner, right? I mean, like there are people who are happy in their jobs for years, sure. mm -hmm. right? I mean, they, they get paid based sure. on how well they work. Everything works. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't necessarily agree with the whole philosophy that there comes a time when people just fall off. Like, I think what you were saying though, I don't want to try to get forward, but what I heard was he was incentivizing performance. So if you're out working in, you know, climbing telephone poles in 95 degree weather, super dangerous job, why you have to wait three years to get a raise? That's ridiculous. You, so you can do your best effort 40 hours a week to help you get a raise in three years? No. You'll bust your ass if you know the hard you work more than you get paid. Exactly. Or whatever incentive that may be. Maybe it's time off. Maybe it's everybody's time. different, right? I mean, we're making big general statements. So, right? it's, so it's individual based. So just to kind of bring it back around to us as entrepreneurs and we're looking ahead and how we're going to grow our company. Um, at a certain point in time, you will, hopefully, if you've done your job well and you've gone through the exercises that Matt has talked us through today or suggested we go through, you will be looking at who you're going to hire and why you're going to hire that person. And it really doesn't matter if that person is 24 years old, 34 years old, 64 years old. What you want to be thinking about is, is this individual a good cultural fit for my organization? Are they going to be working more off of the... I'm going to give 40 years of my hardest work ever, and you need it. You need that from that person. Well, if they're a software developer and they just want to keep chipping away at code, yeah, that might actually be a good fit for you. But if they're going to be your salesperson and they're going to be driven by incentives, commissions, that kind of thing, um, you maybe want to hire a different kind of person or someone who is hungry for a certain kinds of incentives. Um, and then making sure that they have a passion for what you're passionate about, that they possess some of those qualities, some of that um, soul, some of that soul that your company hopes to embody and manifest within it. So um, just thinking through where do you want to go, who do you want to be a part of it, and why is probably really important. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and there's and there's one thing, and, and, and again, not to get too far down this path, but there's Employee employer is all about fit, right? And it's a two-way fit. It's just like a puzzle piece. They either fit with you and you fit with them or you don't. 
okay? And we can go all, talk all about like behavioral interviewing and ideal candidate profiling and all this industrial psychology and all that stuff. But I'll say one of the cardinal mistakes I see people make is they hire based on experience and then they forget everything else. So they go, this person was an absolute rock star in this job, which is exact sounds on paper, exactly the job I'm hiring for in my startup. And they're coming from Raytheon. Is that gonna work? You think it's gonna work, right? It may not. Why? These two jobs have nothing to do with each other. I mean, you're gonna literally put this guy in a cube and go, oh, you're, by the way, you're emptying your own trash, right? There, there is no, right, uh, company retreat. Um, benefit, you want benefits, right? You, you, you can wear shorts. On site? Yeah, you can wear shorts to work, there's a benefit. <laughs> And all of a sudden, you've got this great person that looks on paper and goes, oh my God, I got this guy from Raytheon. And he comes into your little hovel of an office because that's where you're starting at. And they go, uh, nope, 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 nope. Right? <laughs> to your point. <laughs> yeah. All right, anything else? Guys, I'm going to hang out for a few minutes. You know? Thank you all for being here. here.